thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming. So, uh, like you said, I'm Barbara Lechner. I'm here uh, at the TU Munich, a researcher on the Molecule Fellow uh, Fellowship, and I want to show you today how we can record movies on the atomic scale. So, I'm sure you are all aware that everything is made out of atoms. Yeah, that's what we learn in school. Um, so we have the air around us, our own bodies, everything is made out of atoms. But um, what's more, everything is always in motion. Now, of course, um, a gas atmosphere, that's fairly easy to imagine. So you have gas um, that's not very dense and everything is moving around. Even in a liquid, it's still quite obvious that things are moving, that disorder and so on. But I want to also tell you that even in a solid, so everything around you, um, trees, metals, molecules and atoms are constantly in motion. There's uh, vibrational motion, so the motion of atoms in a rigid arrangement around their positions. Um, but there's also chemical reactions happening, which means there's bond formation, bond breaking going on. And so one thing that you could see in everyday life is the oxidation of surfaces. So if you have something made out of steel, um, it can get oxidized, especially if it's in a humid environment or if it's exposed to salt, water and so on. And that's what you would see as rust. Okay? Um, but it also means that this surface of the solid is now chemically transformed. And these chemical reactions, they are important in everyday life, but also in many technical processes. And what I'm trying to do is to understand on a fundamental level um, what drives the dynamics and chemistry on surfaces, okay, so on a solid material. And I want to not just understand them indirectly, I want to really visualize and look at them. The difficulty is that an atom is very small. Now an atom is typically said to be on the order of a bit less than a nanometer. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. But I'm sure even then you still can't really imagine how small it is. So I made a little scale here. This is a logarithmic scale of the length scales that we have. And so every tick is a factor of 10 smaller. So we start up here with kilometers. Uh, kilometers are what you measure distances in if you travel by car, um, heights of tall mountains and so on. Um, meters are more everyday objects, you have um, trees or you can even measure our own size in meters. And we can still of course see things in centimeter scale um, and even just below the millimeter the human eye can still see it so we might be able to make out some structure on a leaf of a tree. But it now gets to a point where a microscope is necessary to really resolve structures well. So we have, of course, the optical microscope, and the optical microscope is useful in this range here, so down to below the micrometer. So this is 10 to minus 6. So we can really look at um, uh, bacteria, for example. Um, we can have microscopes for looking at human cells and so on. But the problem is there's a physical limit. This line here is not arbitrary, this is actually an absolute limit to where the optical microscope with light can go. And that's because the wavelength of visible light is limited. And this, this barrier here is the 300 nanometer, is the physical limit where microscopy ends with the optical light. Many technologies exist to try and push uh, to the smaller scale and really look at atoms. Um, I'm going to present just one today because there are too many different options and the one that I'm presenting is the scanning tunnel microscope which is the microscope that I use in my lab every day. Okay, so the scanning tunnel microscope can really show us things on the nanometer scale so we can look at molecules and we usually don't even look at the big molecules like the hemoglobin but we instead look at things like smaller molecules like carbon dioxide and so on. So scanning tunnel microscopy, um, let's first of all look at what the name means. Microscopy is quite obvious, we want to magnify something, but tunneling might not be a word you come across in everyday life. Tunneling is an effect that we can't explain in classical physics, but instead we need quantum physics to explain that. So imagine you have a hill and you want to bring an object across that hill. In our classical physics view, we would need to put in energy to get it up this hill, and then once it's up there, it has enough energy to roll back down the other side. Okay. 
all grow back down that way, of course. Now, if we think that this object could go through the bottom of this hill to so for a tunnel through, right? Like you have a tunnel through your mountain um, to go through, we wouldn't need to put in this energy to go over there. And this is something, of course, that in everyday life doesn't work. Uh, stone doesn't go, just go through a mountain. But if you scale things down small enough, um, so say we have now an electron that wants to go from the position of one atom to the position of another atom, then this effect can happen. And that's a quantum effect called electron tunneling. Okay, so we have an electron that goes from one atom to the other, and thereby we can measure a very small current. So how do we use that to do microscopy? We have a sharp tip, so every ball here is one atom. And we have a sample also made out of different atoms. <laughs> we have this tip with one atom at the end, and we bring it close enough to that surface that we can have this tunneling current flow. So this tunneling current, I just mark here with this little line. So if it's close enough, we have this current, and that's what we can measure. But just one measurement of that doesn't give us a picture. It's just a punctual measurement. And that's where the third term comes in, the scanning. So scanning and microscopy uh, means we now need to record pixel by pixel this image by scanning across the surface. So what we need and requirements for this method is a very sharp tip, uh, because otherwise we don't have a very good resolution. So we need one atom at the end. Uh, we need a precise motor because we need to move across that surface in very small and precise steps. And of course, we need to be able to measure these small currents. So this is what it looks like if I just demonstrate. So I measure at each pixel the tunneling current and I record that to assemble my uh, picture pixel by pixel. This is a method. Um, it might sound quite hard with all these requirements, but it was actually developed at the beginning of the 80s. Um, by scientists in uh, Switzerland, and they received the Nobel Prize just a few years later because it was really a groundbreaking discovery uh, that by just making this very fine motor, we can really monitor things on surfaces uh, very easily. What comes out is an image like this. So, in, in practice, we don't do what I showed in this animation, we don't move one pixel per atom. We need, need to have more pixels per atom, because otherwise we wouldn't get a very nice image. And if we do that here, we have bright blobs, but every bright blob is one atom, and we see the arrangement of um, atoms in a metal surface. But the problem is that, like you've seen in my animation, we need to move, and it's quite slow. Right? It's not as nice as taking a snapshot with a microscope. So to see um, a time evolving surface, uh, we need to make this method faster. So to go faster, the, the challenge is mainly um, the steps between the pixels. Okay? We, if we just make it faster, we get into some technical problems because things start to shake. And then if we want to see atoms, we can't really have any vibrations because the vibrations would be bigger than what we're trying to measure. And there are def uh, different technical solutions. So uh, mine is by no means unique or the first one or breaking any records. I'm just uh, presenting it because it's one way uh, to do it that I'm using in the lab. In fact, here in Munich at the LNU, the uh, other university here in Munich, there's actually some uh, <laughs> there's actually some pioneers um, that have really uh, made fast scanning time microscopy um, quite a while ago and are still uh, very active in this field. But the solution that I'm presenting today is one that I'm developing together with colleagues here at Tum and also in uh, Trieste at Electra. And it's to uh, use the same instrument, but just move the tip a bit differently. So we bring it to the surface and move it in a smooth pendulum motion. Okay? So rather than measure pixel by pixel, we just record the pixels while moving the tip in a smooth way. And this way, we don't get this vibration problem, we, we can measure much faster. This tip swings with about 1000 hertz, uh, so 1000 times per second. Okay? It doesn't need to go very far, and it's very small, so it can swing very fast. Um, we then record while we're swinging with about 300,000 uh, times, uh, so we record 300,000 pixels per second. Um, the result is that because we're doing a, a sinusoidal motion of our tip, 
Um, and we measure the pixels evenly spaced in time. We need to project the pixels back onto our real space axis. And so we have um, the, uh, the higher pixel density on the edge of our movie than in the middle. And we need to calculate back, back where the pixels were to actually get an image. So we don't have a nice uh, pixel spacing anymore. But we know the motion so we can calculate and, uh, and in the end we can receive movies just going back and forth again and again over the same spot on the surface. We get movies with 20 frames per second very easily. Now this is a rate um, that's close to what TV movies are as well, um, about 24 movies. So I'm saying this because now we're getting to the point where our eye can't really distinguish between frames anymore. Okay? So we really watch things live as they're happening. And of course, if you then push the frame rate even higher, then we would have to slow it down and really be able to see what's going on. Okay. This is what it looks like in a lab. Um, so, this is a, a really big machine, and most of this thing has nothing to do with the microscope. The surroundings are really just to have vacuum, to have controlled environments, and so on. So, this, this whole big setup, it, it always looks a bit in, improvised, but it's actually highly sophisticated. <laughs> and in here, yeah, just in this chamber, one tiny thing, if you take it out, so this is my colleague holding it, we had to repair it at one point. Um, and this is a very fragile tiny thing, which is a microscope. And even here, the most part of what you see is just the motor, so these plates are what moves against each other. And the tip you can't even see, it's so small, it's one tiny bit of wire with one atom at the end, okay? <laughs> so it's, it's really uh, a small piece. Okay, so we have this microscope, what can we actually do with it? Um, one thing that we are trying to understand is uh, the um, roughening and flattening of surfaces. So if you have a surface that's atomically flat, every atom is in the same plane, um, then sometimes you can change the conditions, add some um, gas molecules to the atmosphere, or change the temperature, and so on. Um, or we can even bombard it, and we can roughen the surface. Um, so we have lots of steps. And then we might want to flatten it again. Okay, so this is just um, a bit of a game you can play, but also, of course, it means that we make the surface more or less reactive. So that, that's a point to this. Um, here's an example where we have an iron oxide surface. So um, this is Fe3O4. So for every three iron atoms, we have four oxygen atoms. What we did here is we made some small holes into this surface, so the purple is darker. It's, it's a bit deeper setting. And that's by removing oxygen atoms from the surface, because then the iron atoms go down under the surface because they don't have the bonding part anymore in this ratio of 3 to 4. So if we want to flatten it again, we need to bring oxygen atoms back so that these iron atoms feel they can come back to the surface and really then make this nice bond again. Okay, so that's what we do here. We add oxygen to our atmosphere, which is um, put some gas around, and then we watch what's happening. And here you see lots of stuff moving on this surface, okay? So this fuzzy thing is stuff that's moving faster than we can see. But what you can actually see is that whole is shrinking. So things attach, and then they grow, and then as we watch, the hole is getting smaller and smaller, and we're really filling it back up. Now, we learn from this that we have a really high mobility of these iron atoms, and so we can really uh, try and understand the material properties um, on an atomic scale. Another example I want to show you today is one that got me very excited when I saw it in the lab. So this was really one of the, the most special days, because it showed us that everything works as we want. So, why am I so excited? We have here a little core, um, this hexagonal hole, okay, we make a surface that's uh, called boron nitride, and we can make it so that we have uh, a little container that's just big enough that we can put a nanoparticle in it. This nanoparticle contains three atoms. It's a palladium-3 nanoparticle, okay? Um, nanoparticles are everywhere around you. They are not just in the air as unwanted pollution, but they're also in your sunscreen. So we really want to understand what they do. They could be useful um, to use as catalysts in chemical reactions. And, and so we want to understand that properties better. So we have this nanoparticle here. And as we watch it, we see that it moves around in this little hole forever and ever and ever. We were watching it for hours. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, fantastic. You are very excited. So this part is moving up, but it's not just a nice moving path. I mean, we learn a lot from watching this. What do we learn? If we look in every frame where this particle is centered, we get then a heat map of all the frames of this movie where each point is where the location was at one point. And we see that there are six uh, locations where this particle is oriented most often. Okay. That tells us that the particle feels some forces in that core, even though this little hole looks pretty flat in our microscope, there's some structure in there from the atoms underneath, and the particle feels these atoms and thereby sits uh, preferentially in some places than others. Okay. But in addition to that location information, we also gain a lot from looking at the motion. So if we look at how these dots are connected, then we get more information. And that's, um, we jump from the position 5 to 6 more often than we jump from 5 to 4. And we have three pairs, five and six, three and four, and one and two. These three pairs are easier to jump between, whereas between the pairs it's harder to jump. And that then tells us again more about this um, periodicity of the, and the shape and the forces that are acting on this particle in this uh, little core here. So what we're gaining from this measurement isn't really accurate information about the um, forces um, acting on this so in summary, I've uh, hopefully convinced you that um, we have a microscope where we can really look at phenomena on the atomic scale, we can look at molecules, nanoparticles, and so on. There are many fascinating phenomena to explore out there. I've just shown you two examples where we're looking at roughening and flattening of surfaces and motion of nanoparticles. But of course, our aim is to really watch a chemical reaction um, as it happens live and to understand all this on a very fundamental level. So the second kind of microscope helps us to understand these fundamental processes and by making it fast we are trying to get the time resolution to understand dynamics as well as structures. Thank you. Yes, 
questions and other influences from the outside. And so part of it is what we've seen, this big apparatus with this big chamber, it really protects us a lot. So this is mostly um, the protection from gas molecules from the air, because our air is actually so dense that a clean surface will completely oxidize very, uh, very quickly. We couldn't even measure one image. Um, the other thing is we have this whole machine um, on um, soft dampening legs so that the vibrations are isolated and then inside the chamber um, the STM itself the microscope itself is hanging on springs and, and there are some magnets that then damp the, um, the motion so if we, if we hit it a little bit the magnets will compensate and it will stop the shaking very quickly. Um, so yeah, um, in, if, you, if you have a bad day, you can see every time somebody flaps, but on, on a normal day, it's fine. <laughs> I am very sorry that we don't have more time for questions, but after the event, you can always ask any questions you want to bother. So you'll be around for a minute, okay? Thank you, Barbara.